Good evening. Broadcasting for the IWC self-synchronization team, this is the Self-Sync Live. Welcome to our broadcast. I'm Michaela and I'll be your host for tonight's session. Also from the IWC Self-Sync team is Dave, working behind the scenes to make this broadcast happen. We have a very exciting show lined up for you tonight with none other than Rear Admiral Nancy Norton. But first, um, the purpose of the IWC self-synchronization is to share unclassified information enhance our collective situational awareness and facilitate the development of a common Navy information warfare community culture by allowing us to better engage across disciplines and sub-communities. The IWC self-sync team is comprised of volunteers from all corners of the IWC to include active duty and reserve, officer, enlisted, and civilians, all working anonymously on your behalf. If we had lawyers or JAG, they'd probably tell us to read a disclaimer about the sponsorship of this broadcast, so here it is. The IWC Self-Sync Team is an independent group not officially sponsored by the Department of Defense, the U.S. Navy, or the information warfare community. And to be honest, that independence makes it that much more effective. Again, to reiterate the information and opinions presented in this forum by the IWC Self-Sync Team and our guests should not be construed as official in any way. So now that we've got that out of the way, let's move on to our show. Joining us tonight is Rear Admiral Nancy Norton, currently wearing several hats. She's the Director of Warfare Integration for Information Warfare at OPNAV, the Deputy Director of Navy Cybersecurity, and is also the Information Professional Community Leader. So with all that, we're very grateful to have her here with us uh, tonight on our show. So thank you very much for joining us, ma'am. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here tonight. And thank you for everybody that's joining us on this, uh, this IWC Self-Sync. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to such a great audience. Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, before we get started, um, do you mind giving us a quick overview of your uh, career path and what brought you to your current job today? Sure. So uh, I joined the Navy uh, from officer candidate school as a general unrestricted line officer. And uh, back in those days, so that was a long time ago, long before uh, for, before most of the time of most people in the audience, uh, the general unrestricted line community was, uh, was um, a variety of different jobs, uh, all shore based. And um, one of the kind of um, main career paths or, or uh, tracks, I think is what we called them back then, was communications. And so I started out as a communications officer. My first tour was at NAVCAM's Eastpac in Hawaii as a communications officer. And uh, for the general unrestricted line officer community back in those days, um, they actually encouraged everybody in the community to um, to move from track to track. So basically it was a communications track, an administration track, and more of a logistics or uh, type of track. And, um, and that's what a lot of people did. I um, decided not to follow the advice of all of the, the detailers and stuck with communications. So I went from a communications job uh, at the largest communication station in the world to one of the smallest where I was officer in charge in Fallon, Nevada at the Naval Air Station there and decided that I really liked communications and computer networks and and uh, back then we were just starting to see uh, computers coming in and, and local area networks coming into being and um, the uh, potential uh, advances and how that was really changing the work of, in communications and so it was really exciting to me. So from there, I decided to go to the Naval Postgraduate School and get a master's degree in computer uh, computer science, and that set me on the track to uh, to the world that I'm in. And I've pretty much been in all C4 ISR kinds of jobs uh, since then, with a couple of unusual exceptions. Um, so after PG school, I went to uh, US PACOM, worked in the J6 there, and started in um, computer security, it was called back then, or information assurance, and then network security. And uh, so really started in cybersecurity back before anybody really even thought about what that was in 1993. Went from there to uh, PAC Fleet in six and was doing the same thing there for the Navy instead of the joint world and really liked cybersecurity kinds of uh, challenges and grew to, uh, to enjoy that more and more over time. And uh, after that tour, then I got the opportunity to finally go to 
uh, an afloat command, and I was the uh, C4I officer on the um, the Enterprise Strike Group staff out of Mayport, Florida, and that was just a fantastic opportunity, and I loved that, loved going to see, um, loved being able to uh, kind of integrate all of the things that I'd learned over the course of my career, and um, and then from there, let's see, what was after that? Then I went to OpNav for the first time, and uh, then took command of NCTS Bahrain in, during uh, uh, OIF and OEF and had a great tour there and then uh, went from there to Navier 6 Fleet where I was the N6 there and then uh, back to uh, Newport, Rhode Island for um, the Naval War College and then back to the OPNAV staff again where I had a number of different jobs and so started out in the in the Quadrennial Defense Review where I had all the C4ISR programs for the QDR and really started um, expanding my portfolio beyond just communications and in, uh, in, in cybersecurity kinds of things uh, out into the ISR a whole lot more and into space a lot more. So that was really interesting and, and really, I think, uh, helped me uh, grow into what would eventually become the information warfare community and understand how all of the, the different communities fit together much more because I actually had um, all of the the uh, disciplines working for me at that point in uh, in QDR, so it was very similar to you know what we've done with the community since then. So I did that. Then I was uh, EA for Admiral Harris when he was the OpNav in six, and um, and helped to uh, on the reorganization team for Admiral Roughhead to stand up the in two and six and the information warfare community. And um, so I. I uh, have a whole lot of ownership and pride in, in what we've done with the information warfare community since then because I was part of it from the early days and, uh, and I'm really proud to see how far we've advanced in that. And uh, after that, then I got to work in, uh, in two and six for a while, working ISR capabilities, which was a great opportunity again to bring a different perspective um, from the IP community to uh, really work in manned and unmanned ISR platforms and um, loved that job. And then uh, I was hired by Admiral Greener to be his executive assistant when he was the vice chief and did that until he became CNO and then I moved with him to, uh, to be his EA as CNO uh, as well. So wonderful opportunity, completely out of community in that job, but, uh, but a real eye opener to understand the, you know, the top level of our Navy and how the, the uh, Defense Department works from that perspective. Um, from there, I went to be on the CNO Strategic Studies Group in Newport, Rhode Island, and uh, worked on the study for maintaining uh, maintaining undersea superiority, and was a really fun tour for me. And then, uh, then I was picked up for flag, and so I was assigned to be the PACOM J6. So I got to be go back to PACOM, uh, but this time as the J6, and uh, that was a wonderful opportunity as well. And uh, and then from there came back to OpNav for my third time, and I uh, am the Director of Warfare Integration, as you said. Wow, that's, uh, that's really impressive. I've, um, now I'm really excited to have you here. Um, I, just, I read a brief overview of your bio, but to hear you talk about all the things you've gotten to do through your career, it's, um, it, it's, really, it's, it's great for us to be able to have you here and to um, engage with you. Um, so with, um, we did have some questions regarding what it is you currently do at OpNav, and you've been so kind enough to actually forward us some slides so you can give an overview um, for us and the audience as to what it, what it is you do. So I'll let you go ahead and segue into that, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, just briefly, I want to kind of go through uh, a couple of high points of what the OpNav N2 and 6 does and what, uh, what warfare integration is all about. And um, I think it's important for our community to understand um, not just how they fit into the community, but what the portfolio is that we're responsible for and how all of that supports um, the entire community and the joint force ultimately. So if you can go to the next slide, Dave. So first of all, I want to remind everybody, if you haven't read the um, CNO's uh, Design for Maintaining Maritime Superiority yet, you really need to do that. First of all, I will point out on the cover of the, uh, of the document itself in that picture, you see the ones and zeros at the top? That's not an accident. Uh, CNO is absolutely committed to 
uh, information warfare, and the ones and zeros just represent how important he sees um, cyber and cyberspace fitting into uh, maintaining maritime superiority. And he talks about it throughout the document in a, a number of different ways. He talks about the need to ingrain information warfare in everything that we do. And he talks about the, the challenges that we face in um, today and into the future in this highly informationalized and contested environment that we have not, that, that continues to grow. We've seen it in the past, but it just keeps getting uh, orders of magnitude more complex. And, um, and it's really our challenge in the IWC as well as the rest of the Navy, but, but we really lead that effort in um, understanding what we need to be prepared for in the future and what that means for the capabilities that, uh, that have to be provided to the naval forces. Next slide. So uh, just as a quick overview and reminder, um, on the bottom of these slides, you'll see the Assured C2 Battle Space Awareness and Integrated Fires. Those are the pillars of the information warfare strategy and, um, and have been consistent for several years now and remain so. And the, the idea of, of those three pillars uh, is pretty important to understand and understand how that all of that vision fits in. So um, Assured C2, really it's the backbone of our Navy capabilities. It is uh, not, not assuring the command and control systems, but having um, command and control systems that assure our commander's ability to command and control their forces. So that's that's really a lot more about um, understanding the, the capabilities that we have, understanding how to maneuver in the electromagnetic spectrum, and um, what it means to actually provide the right kind of information to the decision makers at any given time, not just data, but information that can be used as knowledge for decision making and, um, and, and getting that out to the the uh, commanders at the tactical level, operational level, and strategic level. And then battle space awareness, which is a very broad and vast uh, uh, tasking, really. It is all about understanding our entire environment, understanding the, the battle space that we operate in from the, the uh, oceanographic and meteorological um, types of, of understanding that are required, the, um, the deep understanding of our adversaries and potential adversaries, uh, and understanding everything that is around us in all domains, and, and being able to use all of that information, all of that battle space awareness to help us be more predictive in our responses to any challenges that we have. And um, really, you know, we, we see this, uh, almost ubiquitous uh, expanse of sensor capability in the world in, uh, in the future. And we have sensors from seafloor to space and figuring out how to uh, most effectively automate the, the correlation and fusion of all of that data to something that, again, can provide uh, the best possible uh, uh, knowledge to our decision makers. And then finally, the integrated fires and what that means taking all of that knowledge to, to uh, be able to actually help to um, put um, uh, either um, forces in the right place when they need to be or weapons on the right target when they need to be. And th that means uh, kinetic fires and non-kinetic fires and understanding how all of those fit together. Um, really uh, understanding what is required to integrate those capabilities across uh, all of our our uh, domains and all of our platforms, not just in the information warfare community, but across across the entire Navy and the Joint Force. Next slide. So just a little bit about some of the challenges uh, that we have in, in 2 and 6 and some of our, our um, biggest programs and biggest efforts that we have ongoing. Um, one of those, I'll, I'll start from the, uh, from the upper left there, the Ashore Network Consolidation. Um, Engine or Next Generation Enterprise Network is one of our largest programs as far as our the funding amounts go in in two and six, and um, and that will continue to be. We are are have one of the largest uh, networks in the world across the Navy with Engine, and that will be growing even more as we consolidate OneNet, our OCONUS networks into that, and then continue to expand even more as we pull in other legacy networks and, uh, and um, 
R&D networks into that uh, consolidated network. And, uh, and we'll be recompeting that contract next year. So a lot of interesting challenges there. The next one is the afloat network wholeness. And so that's really about canes and um, building towards a single consolidated network on our, on our ships and in our submarines. And again, one of our, um, one of our largest programs as far as the budget goes. And um, very complex to pull all of those pieces together, what used to be a lot of different networks and, uh, and applications that go across resource sponsors and lots of different stakeholders for, that have to be able to use that network. And, and then all of the communications pass off of that network so that we can, uh, we can provide the best possible bandwidth and reliability to our ships and submarines uh, when, they're, when they're at sea. The next one is elect electromagnetic maneuver. There is a lot in that uh, portfolio, in the, the EW portfolio. Uh, some of, uh, many of our systems, our uh, largest budgets, budgetary systems are fall into the EW uh, portfolio. And understanding how we best employ all of the electronic warfare um, systems across the board from um, sensing to attack to protection and everything in between and then combining all of that for um, the kinds of capability that we will continue to need to um, to integrate into all of our O plans in the future. It's really important and a lot of great effort has been going on in the fleet in the last few years there. And then the next one, offensive and defensive, um, cyber and electronic warfare and how all of that fits together. There is so much going on in that world. Many of you are, 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 you know, cybersecurity is still huge. Like I said, I started in cybersecurity way back in 1993 and uh, never thought that it would be as big as it is today. Um, it is absolutely huge. And, uh, and we continue to integrate new capabilities in offensive um, cyber and electronic warfare. Michaela, can you hear me okay? Because I just got a, a warning that my microphone wasn't working. Uh -oh, you, you did kind of, uh, there was some uh, interference a little bit, but I was able to hear most of what you said, ma'am. Okay, so I'll continue. Let me know, give me a, a thumbs down if, uh, if you, I drop out for some reason. So the next yeah. one is transitions in, uh, in ISR, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance. That's really exciting, the work that is happening to go from, uh, from almost entirely manned or entirely manned uh, platforms in uh, airborne ISR to largely unmanned uh, uh, airborne systems in ISR, and then continuing to expand on the ISR capabilities that we have for different types of uh, VTUAVs and um, unmanned surface vehicles and uh, undersea vehicles and of course, um, uh, sensors from all different platforms as well. So all of that integration of ISR capability is really interesting and will continue to be a, a major issue as we go forward. And then Assured C2 for the fleet. So we talked about that. That's really about you know, making sure that we've got the, the, uh, our Navy's unique requirements voiced to the joint world so that the, the, uh, the communications um, systems, the SATCOM systems are um, available and will support the Navy's needs. And then all of the, the afloat and um, ground-based systems that are required to provide the resiliency for assured C2 that we need. Next slide. And then our people exciting um, uh, capability that we have all of those systems, but it's really the people that make it uh, an increased warfighting capability. And so, um, so this really shows the people that we have in the information warfare community. And uh, as it says, over 52,000 people in the Navy in the information warfare community. We are a very large force and uh, an absolutely critical force for all of the designators and, uh, and of course, the space cadre that is not a designator but is part of the information warfare community. And um, so within OpNav in 2 and 6, we have uh, a lot of different pieces that we um, we work for the people, whether that's uh, paying for billets 
and um, training requirements and overseeing ratings and uh, looking at the, the right kinds of training for the future, what the curriculum might be uh, at all levels of training. And so uh, focusing on the people is a big part of what we do on, at the OpNav staff and uh, in, in two and six. And next slide, I think that's my last slide. So uh, just the bumper sticker there that you'll see, information in warfare, information as warfare. I really like that slogan. I think it, uh, it says a whole lot about what we do and how we're moving forward in information warfare. And with that, I will uh, open, open it up to questions and back to you. All right, thank you very much, ma'am. Um, so with that whole overview, it seems like from you know, your early days, um, your early career, the uh, information warfare community um, has come a long way to non-existent to, we've now developed, um, you know, cadres of people. We have uh, specialty areas that um, we have uh, uh, people focused in. And um, that kind of segues into our first question. As you've seen the IW community emerge and come into its own, what are some challenges that the community uh, faced early on? And how do you remember seeing those uh, overcome? Well, the first thing is that or organizational change is hard, and the hardest part of any organizational change is the cultural change. So, uh, so Alma Roughhead really um, took on a significant challenge led by uh, by Admiral Dorset under him to create this information warfare community and um, break down the tribes and the tribal mentality of the designators and um, and figure out how to start mixing up the, the what used to be stovepipes of excellence within the designators and it's not easy to do that it really is a significant challenge and I would say that you know one of the most important um, uh, things that has to be done if you're gonna make a big cultural change is you have to have senior leadership buy-in. And so if it hadn't come from Admiral Roughhead, from the CNO himself, it probably would have failed very quickly because there was a lot of resistance, resistance within the community and resistance from, um, from a lot of those, the other uh, senior leaders in the Navy that just didn't like anything else, didn't see any reason to change. You know we're working fine as we are. Why do we need to make make these changes? But uh, but he could see a, a vision of the the need to pull the types of things that we do together uh, and and really um, increase war fighting capability in a completely different way by combining the efforts. And uh, I think one of the things that a lot of people um, probably didn't see at the time. But like I said, some of the work that I had done, like in QDR and others, uh, I could see how much overlap there really was between uh, what the IPs do, what the METOC community does, what the, the intelligence community does, and what the cryptologic warfare community does, and see how, you know, when, you, when each of those communities are working independently, they can produce great things. But when they start to combine them and, um, and bring in the perspective of another community, the, the capability and the, um, the types of solutions that, that uh, a team will come up with with that kind of diversity is so much more powerful and long lasting and um, well thought out than it could possibly ever be with, uh, with, within a, a single designator. Great, thank you, ma'am. I'm actually gonna skip ahead um, to a question regarding um, that integration. So lately we've been seeing a lot of cross-pollination um, in terms of having, you know, CEOs from different designators uh, be commanding officers in their, their non-traditional designator field. Um, uh, so I personally think it's very beneficial and it seems like from your perspective you'd agree and um, we're going to start seeing that more. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, we will. And in fact, uh, one of the exciting uh, decisions that we just made, the uh, the IWC flag panel just made recently, was that uh, the O4 uh, XOs across the information warfare community are all going to be cross detailed. So uh, you know, there's been a lot of concern about making sure that that we don't lose our um, fundamental uh, technological 
um, and um, core capabilities of our designators by doing too much cross detailing too early. But one of the jobs that clearly can be cross detailed without having an impact on our on our uh, uh, core capabilities is being an XO because an XO is really not about um, so much about the operational aspects of a command, but it's about the administrative and leadership aspects of the command. So that gives a great opportunity for a in designator commanding officer at the 05 level to to really understand and be the technical expert for the the command that they're uh, they're the CEO of, but have an XO that gets exposed to that command from another designator and brings a different perspective and allows them to to learn and to advise the CEO from a really different perspective. And I think it's really wonderful. And uh, and at other opportunities, I think we've seen some real successes in um, not cross detailing but but moving adding billets or um, changing billets to be coded to a different designator at a um, for example where you are at a NIOC um, where we have an IP officer and a METOC officer that that are now um, able to bring the expertise that they have and teach a, an awful lot to the other people that are in there and um, and then be able to um, expand everybody's horizons, expand their thought processes on how things are done from, like I said, a different perspective. So I think that's really a big benefit of the work that we're doing to, uh, to integrate the information warfare community. Great, thank you so much, ma'am. Um, I'm gonna go to one of our previous questions that was asked. Um, cybersecurity is still quite a hot topic and probably will be for quite some time. Um, and But what are some of the additional challenges and benefits um, you see on the horizon with respect to fleet maritime operations? Um, you've already mentioned canes and, and um, creating systems that are more integrative and bringing legacy systems in. Um, but have we been able to see additional improvements with mitigating vulnerabilities in doing this and having our um, own IWC, and this goes into a separate question, but I'll pull it in here, um, our own information warfare commander um, out there uh, from our own communities uh, leading the fight. Yeah, an awful lot of the, the, um, the technical upgrades that we've been doing on our ships in particular, and ships and submarines in particular, have really uh, focused on increasing the, the, the cyber defense capabilities decreasing the threat vectors that are open, potentially open to adversaries, uh, providing more of a baseline, uh, understand, understood um, cyber baseline so that we can uh, maintain that baseline easier and quicker and hopefully with less manpower. So a lot of work has been done there. Uh, certainly a lot of work has been done in terms of providing um, redundant paths off of our ship for communications and uh, resilient paths, so uh, not just going over a different part of the, the electromagnetic spectrum, but um, having different satellites that have different ground stations in different areas. So there's a lot of different ways that we are, are working to um, maintain that kind of capability for our fleet forces. Uh, some of the things that we're doing, you talked about with the information warfare community or warfare commander, that's really exciting and, uh, and is something that that I have pushed for for quite some time. I um, firmly believe that that the information warfare uh, commander for a strike group should be somebody who has uh, spent their career in information related capabilities and working that and not somebody who uh, who is doing it part time and has had very little experience in it but is still trying to figure out how to bring value to the to the uh, strike group commander. And now we're doing that. We've been doing that for a while um, with the IPs, and, and most recently, now we have a, a, a screening board for the information warfare commanders, and we'll continue to do that. And that allows for somebody who has has spent a career in information-related capabilities to start pulling together the kinds of things that I've been talking about with the different designators, and rather than having a stovepipe of understanding. Uh, really pulling all of that into one 
warfare commander who can understand how to integrate the uh, the capabilities and build that battle space awareness that we need and ultimately provide uh, integrated fires with the other warfare commanders. Great, thank you, ma'am. I know there's a lot of people in our community who are really excited about it, so it'll be, um, it'll be interesting to see how that develops. And I think there's, again, a lot of benefit. There can only be benefit to. Absolutely. Believe me, if I was back in your shoes, I would be dreaming about being an information warfare commander afloat someday. And I wish I could go back and do it. <laughs> <laughs> One day. Um, I'm going to pull in a question from the audience. Um, <coughs> pardon me. Um, so we've talked about um, ships now. We'll move over to air. Uh, this question was asked. Um, there was recently yet another portfolio shakeup at the OpNav, um, or OpNav. Unmanned systems were moved in uh, the N99, and the E2 and NextGen Jammer went back to air warfare, et cetera. Is there a right solution that these types of moves are working towards, or is it more a product of keeping uh, resourcing bins flexible to needs direction and strategy? Well, those are two independent actions that were taken really for two different reasons. The N99 was stood up to, um, to provide one single belly button to focus just on unmanned systems. And that was, that was at the direction and, and uh, desire of the Secretary of the Navy. So, um, so that was, you know, he, Secretary Mavis has had a, a, a major focus on unmanned systems and moving unmanned systems as quickly as possible. And he wanted to have um, essentially have a separate um, code on the OpNav staff that would do that and pull all of those pieces together. So that uh, that decision and, and, uh, and reorganization was done a little over a year ago now. The more recent moves uh, were, uh, were part of a whole lot of other moves that um, CNO Richardson made in looking at how best to optimize the Navy staff with uh, his vision for what he wanted to achieve and what his priorities were are as CNO. And, um, and he wanted to create the most efficient and most effective um, organization. And part of his thought process there was that he wanted uh, in two and six to, um, to focus on integration of capabilities and, um, and how to connect and make interoperable all of our platforms and systems and sensors. And, and his idea was that, uh, that we in two and six uh, should focus on the platforms and the connect, I mean, on the payloads and the connectivity and not have have to worry about things like rewinging aircraft and so wanted the platforms to be moved out back to uh, to the n9 and so uh, that was done just uh, just a month ago the first of october and uh, so you know we're still going through that process of uh, making sure that that we have the right con connective tissue between n2 and 6 and all of the the uh, other resource sponsors, but certainly the high nines that have um, platforms that we have to um, work the payloads for and make sure that they're all interoperable. And we've had that that mandate forever, anyway. But um, but you know we had some of those platforms within our own portfolio, and now they're um, they're across different resource sponsors. Okay, that makes sense. So we don't have to become air mechanics, right? <laughs> Um, still along the um, the air vein, um, this was asked by Moon D. A couple years ago, during a third offset strategy thread of discussion, I read about an aerial layer as a fallback medium for long haul communication should our satellite comms fail. Um, what has become of this idea slash research slash development with regard to inf the information warfare vision? That the, uh, what you're talking about there is probably the Joint Aer Aerial Layer Network, or JALIN, and, uh, and we've actually done an awful lot of experimentation and testing and demonstration for that um, concept and continue to do that work even today. Uh, Navy was, was tasked with doing much of the, the testing and demonstration for JALIN. Um, so we've demonstrated the possibility and uh, potential for doing that and providing that kind of connectivity and reach back in a, a, a SATCOM uh, denied or degraded environment. So, um, so certainly is a possibility. 
uh, but then in the future, we'll have to look at whether or not that's uh, fiscally responsible, if that's the best option in terms of how much it would cost to, uh, to actually do that. All right, thank you, ma'am. Um, I'm going to switch back to one of our questions that was um, asked prior to the live show. Um, there has been talks that parts of NOC, Maryland, will be splitting into four separate O5 commands. Um, is that something you can speak to a bit? Yeah, so there's a proposal, and, and I'm not sure exactly where it is in, uh, in the approval process because it has to go through, you know, a number of, of uh, all, man, all command changes and manpower changes have to go through an approval process. But, um, but there's a proposal to um, divide up NIOC Maryland into um, NIOC Maryland and then some subordinate commands that would focus uh, explicitly on certain parts of their mission, and then those would become O5 commands. And, uh, and so we've, we've tentatively slated uh, commanding officers to those O5 commands. So it certainly is, is not something that's, uh, that's, it is something that we are expecting to have happen. And it uh, gives us a, a lot of different things. One, it breaks up uh, what, what has become a very large command in NIAC, Maryland. And, um, and two, it uh, allows for additional O5 command opportunities for the information warfare community with very, um, uh, more tailored specific focus on the the areas that those commands will be doing. So I think there's a lot of value in doing that and uh, and that there's certainly potential for looking at other commands down the road to do something similar, but I don't know if uh, if we are planning any of that yet. All right, well that that answers my follow-on question if if you were if um, we were going to see that implemented at other NIOCs, but I guess we have to see how the the original plan goes first. Right. We move uh, to others. Um, let's see. Um, switching to cyberspace. Uh, this one's from Captain Heritage. Thanks. So. Um, where does defensive cyberspace operations fall within the operational priorities of the IWC? And would uh, we assess our uh, resource investments, uh, manpower training, and technology? Um, would be assessed as are consistent um, with those priorities? Well, I think that's a, a trick question from Captain Heritage, given his, his current uh, position as the commanding officer of Navy Cyber Defense Operations Command. So, so uh, Sean, I'll, I'll give you a shout out there. Yes, we think you're incredibly important. <laughs> Uh, no, there is no doubt that uh, that not just the information warfare community, but the Navy uh, thinks that that uh, defensive cyber operations is incredibly important. Uh, as you will remember, we've stood up Task Force Cyber Awakenings specifically because CNO you know, Greener was uh, was very concerned that we needed to make sure that across the Navy, not just within. Uh, the information warfare community and in into and six and fleet cybercom and the subordinate commands, but the entire Navy recognized the importance of of uh, cyber defense and the the kinds of things that we need to do to prepare for um, future uh, potential adversaries and um, to make sure that we understood how to mitigate the vulnerabilities that we might be putting in place. Uh, across the board, so I think that uh, it's a it's a major priority. Uh, we have added significant uh, investment in terms of dollars and manpower in defensive cyberspace, and uh, and continue to do that. And I expect that, and not just the Navy, but the Joint Force uh, across the board has done that over the the past. Oh shoot! If I look back, at least five or six years, we've made significant in, uh, increases in our top line to support cyber defense and continue to do that. And some of that is at the mandate of OSD and some of uh, mandate of Congress. Wow! All right. So there you go, sir. <laughs> um, here's a question from what what sounds like a future cyber warrior. Um, I've been interested in joining the Navy, but I'm currently going to school for a computer science degree. Um, any comments or thoughts on finishing my degree first or joining right away? Well, I would ask how far along you are. So if, uh, if you're close to finishing, I wouldn't even think about doing anything else. Finish your degree. But if you're just starting out, it really depends on, on um, what, you, what you like to do. 
the options in um, in this career field in in computer science and and uh, cyber related fields are uh, are really incredible for both our officer and enlisted force. And of course, uh, even if you enlist, you you always have opportunities to uh, to work towards some type of commissioning program. Uh, further down in your career and have the Navy help pay for your degree uh, along the way. So um, so that certainly is a great option for anyone to consider. If, if you like what you're doing in computer science, you really should consider joining the Navy and becoming an information warrior, uh, either a, uh, an information professional like me or a cryptologic warfare officer like, uh, like Michaela and, um, and a lot of other people. Uh, we, you know, that kind of of um, core capability, core uh, technological um, skill set is exactly what we're looking for. So, um, just kind of going off that question with regard to the um, 1840 designator, our cyber engineers. Can you mm -hmm. tell us a little bit more about how that program is developing out, or what um, what skills and expertise? Um, the communities looking for in those officers in particular. So uh, that's one area where we have it's it's kind of a niche. Um, it's a very small number in terms of the community. Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember. I want to say we only have about fifteen billets in the of the CWEs, um, cyber warfare engineers, and um, but but really exciting work and really wonderful opportunities that they get to uh, as officers. Um, with technical degrees, get to really get their hands dirty in um, in trying to solve really tough problems uh, as engineers. And it's not an opportunity that a whole lot of people in the Navy get to do um, like that, where they where they're you know they're they're really almost the mad scientists in the um, the cyber world. And uh, it, you know, great support for doing that, and the potential for um, some really good. Uh, follow-on work and um, recognition and uh, you know understanding that of, of the findings that they have uh, can really change the way we do business in the Navy so it's a great opportunity it's really really interesting uh, but you have to be qualified so you really do have to be a technical expert to become a CWE and um, so those that become CWEs, do they tend to have PhDs or do they tend to have um, years of experience in, in their field first? Or what are what what composes the, those 15 CWEs? Uh, they don't have to have PhDs, certainly. And in fact, they don't even have to have a master's degree. They, they can certainly work towards it, and that helps uh, an awful lot. But but I don't think there's a requirement for a master's degree. Uh, but but certainly um, having additional expertise in working in the career field is is very helpful for a selection board for that. Uh, but you know, showing the kinds of things that you have done and uh, are interested in doing, um, either either at work or in your off time, that help to demonstrate that you know you really do have that knack for um, for cyber engineering kinds of, of of work, and they have the creativity and um, unconstrained thinking that you really need to, uh, to go into that work. All right, thank you, ma'am. Um, we've got one more question, not to get too political, but we all know the results of the election. Um, and based on various outlets, President-elect Donald Trump seems to be very pro-military spending. Um, so with that, and again, we have yet to see how all of this plays out, but Based on that, how do you think um, that will affect upcoming Navy programs and budgeting, um, particularly for the IC? So every presidential transition uh, comes with a, an awful lot of uncertainty, even if you're changing from one president to another in the same same party. And a change of party is really a significant uh, um, upheaval for the programmatics and the budgeting for um, for the Department of Defense. So it's really hard at this point to understand some of the specifics about what uh, President-elect Trump might do uh, as he comes into office. As you said, you know he has made a lot of statements about um, about his perspective that the Navy is too small and we need more ships and we need more capability. Well, um, I, I would say that if I were an advisor to to uh, President-elect Trump, I would make sure that he understood that. A ship is not a capability. A ship is a platform, 
and you load capability onto that platform, whether that's the combat systems and weapon systems and engineering systems and all of the C4 ISR kinds of uh, equipment that, that actually um, make it a capable warfighting uh, platform, and then putting the people with the right level of training and expertise and the ability to um, routinely practice that. Uh, so that's a really big tail to a platform. And so the point is, uh, w w the last thing that we want is to add a whole bunch of ships to the Navy without the kinds of sustainment tail and all of the, the equipping that we actually need to make it effective in uh, a war fight. So, um, so if, in fact, he wants to uh, expand the capability of the Navy, then it needs to be the entire um, cost of, of all of that, not just adding ships so that we have a higher ship count. Yes, ma'am. Kind of like buying a bunch of houses but not having furniture in it. That's exactly right. <laughs> um, so I'm um, shifting gears to, we have a couple leadership questions, ma'am. Um, let's see, what are, what are some of the qualities you look for in those you work with? And along that same vein, um, and those to whom uh, you look for inspiration? Well, uh, I would say that what I look for in the people around me is um, open-mindedness, first of all, people who are um, eager and willing to attack problems and look for solutions, not that uh, that just shy away and think uh, they can't possibly solve the problem. I really like uh, people who stretch the, the limits of their authority and responsibility. I, I don't ever like the kinds of people who say, well, that's not my job. Um, or somebody who says, well, you know, I'm too junior to, to try to fix that problem, or um, I don't have the, you know, the right qualifications to fix that problem. I like the people who say, you know, I'm an ensign, but I'm going to do this anyway. And that really impresses me. Uh, I oftentimes will sit, will tell people when they, you know, when I talk to them, if they say that I'm just an ensign, I will tell them I don't ever want to hear the word just a, because if you're if you're a uh, seaman in the United States Navy, the power that you have to influence the the capabilities and the war fighting and national security that we have is tremendous. And you should be looking at what your opportunities are and your your authority is, not what the limits of that is. And so that same uh, kind of approach or kind of uh, thought process is also what I look for in my mentors because I want somebody that is going to encourage me to, to think bigger and um, broader, not, you know, look inwards and um, look at my limitations. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Um, let's see. Also with that, um, one of our uh, previous questions was, Throughout your career, what have been some of the assignments that you felt you've grown the most from, speaking of growth, and um, whether they were challenging or whether um, you're able in a position where you could make a major impacts, and uh, how did you approach those? Well, that's always hard because every one of my, uh, my jobs has been one that I've, um, I think, grown a lot from and really appreciated in every way. Um, I was a, an OIC as a brand new, you know, young Lieutenant JG, and, um, and at that time I was 299 miles away from my parent command. And so, uh, so having an opportunity to be an independent um, leader far from anybody that was in my chain of command, so I really um, was responsible for my communications center pretty much on my own most of the time, that was an awesome uh, opportunity as a young JG and uh, really set me on a path I think of of feeling uh, some of the things that I just talked about feeling like you know you should never limit yourself based on your rank or um, or those kinds of things but really look at what are the opportunities that you can do and and with that I was able to really influence a whole lot of uh, sailors careers and um, and hopefully their lives and um, many of those are people that I still keep in touch with even today. And um, so that's one. I would say another big one was, uh, was my time on the Enterprise Strike Group staff. So I was on the, the deployment, uh, had just come out of the Arabian Gulf on 9-11. And uh, we had done you know, all of the workups and we had done um, basically five months of our deployment 
at that point. So we had done a couple of, of exercises and a lot of operations in the Arabian Gulf doing uh, Northern Watch and Southern Watch and practicing a whole lot of the kinds of things that we needed to be ready to go to war at any given time. And the 9-11 hit. And all of a sudden, we, we were uh, expected to be ready to go immediately to respond in whatever way the nation needed us to respond. And I will say that that was a, a fantastic um, growth opportunity for, for me personally and for everybody that I worked with because um, we very quickly recognized that we were absolutely ready to do whatever the nation called, uh, called on us to do. And um, all of our training paid off and, and it was much smoother than I ever would have thought in terms of being able to go from training to execution. And um, so that was, that was really a lesson in how important training is and how important it is to have, um, have your forces have the confidence in their ability to do the missions that, uh, that they're assigned to. And then of course, like I said, uh, you know, my, my time as commanding officer was wonderful. I love that. And, uh, and absolutely love the opportunity to lead sailors and, and uh, junior officers at any opportunity that I've had. And uh, working as the EA for Admiral Greener was uh, a fantastic opportunity for me in um, being able to really see a different perspective on how the Navy is run. And then my current job, really seeing the business of the Navy at the level that I am and the responsibility that, uh, that I have and the people that work for me have to uh, prepare the future for the Navy. I think, I think we're really fortunate to have somebody in um, your position who has seen so much and seen so much growth throughout the Navy be at, in the, at that juncture and um, help guide where we're going in the future. And with the training piece, I think there's a, uh, several of our uh, IW brethren out in the Red Sea who can attest to the importance of training. That is um, absolutely right. Um, let's see, we have another question from the audience, ma'am. Um, where are you planning on going next? Um, oh, this is a multi-level question. So we'll start with that one. Where are you planning on going next? Uh, I don't know. That's a decision that's made, that's made um, above me at this point. And um, so at some point I will, uh, I will find out where the Navy wants to send me, and um, and I know whatever the opportunities are, whatever options uh, are chosen for me, that I'll be happy with them because I love everything that we do in our community. Awesome. Um, from the same uh, from the same audience member, um, why why should somebody aspire to become a flag officer? Well, I talked about the scope of influence that you have, regardless of where you have it, uh, you know, how, however small that is to expand it as much as you can. And as a flag officer, your scope of influence and uh, authority to make a difference in the Navy and in the world just gets broader and broader. And, uh, you, you know, it's, it's uh, hard to pass up the opportunity to really make a difference if you're a person that wants to do that. And I, as you go up in um, rank, you get the opportunity to do that more and more. And it's very satisfying to recognize that uh, when you go home at night that you've hopefully made the world a better place and, uh, and, <clears throat> and hopefully uh, helped the people around you to be better themselves in whatever their goals are. All right, thank you, ma'am. Um, and maybe this is a loaded question for all of the IWU uh, team members, but um, which leader should we invite to be our uh, next uh, interviewee? Oh, let's see. Well, we were talking earlier. I think you should, uh, you definitely should try to get CNO on here. All right, shoot for the moon, right? That's right. But you know, if uh, if you can't get Admiral Richardson to do it, I think Admiral Moran would love to do it. The Vice Chief, you know, when he was uh, CNP, he did videos all the time. So so that would be a good one to hear from. So he's a natural. We'll 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 send it to the chains and maybe ask him. Maybe he's listening. We'll see. Good. Um, <laughs> another uh, question from our audience. Um, 
Oh, what is a book you have read this year and uh, what would you recommend? Oh, um, let's see. I've read a number of books that are scary. So one of them was Lights Out by Ted Koppel. And, uh, and it really is, was interesting. I've, uh, there's sort of these doomsday books that I've gotten into just to kind of understand and, uh, and have somebody who's done a lot of research uh, go through some of the significant uh, capability losses that we would have if we, so for lights out, it's if we, uh, if we lost major parts of our power grid and how that would um, rapidly impact the entire United States and what that would do in um, regions and uh, what the cascading effect would be for that. So if you look at something like a uh, like a Hurricane Sandy, where there were power outages, but they were, you know, they were pretty localized, and um, and it, it, you know, very quickly impacted the um, transportation grid. But if you expanded that even just a little bit more, the potential for disaster would be would go up tremendously uh, in places, particularly in our dense cities like New York City, where if you didn't have transportation and you didn't have electricity. Things like um, spoiling food and um, disease would spread very rapidly, and our ability to uh, get people in and out of the city where it was affected, and particularly if it was more regional, would be pretty scary. So that's one that I I recommend to everybody, but uh, but it's a downer. <laughs> well, uh, duly noted. Well, just um, with that question, does it address maybe? Um uh, us as a culture, not really preparing ourselves individually for that, always relying on the government to uh, be prepared to make those decisions for us? It does. It talks a lot about, he goes into a whole section about uh, what kinds of things that, you know, individuals need to, to think about and be prepared for, like having food stocks so that you, you know, uh, food that will, that isn't perishable and, uh, and what that means for an individual or for a family and, um, and how uh, woefully unprepared most people in this country are for any kind of um, even minor natural disaster, much like anything that would be a catastrophic uh, uh, effect on our country um, from an adversary. And as a cyber warfare leader, I'm sure it's something you, you think about professionally too, not just in your off time reading. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, we have another question from the audience, ma'am. Um, what is the next hard decision for the IWC that you see? Hmm. Well, I don't know that it's a decision, but the next hard step for the IWC, I think, is going to be um, the creation of the Information Warfare Development Command. Uh, you know, all of the other uh, domains have a Warfare Development Command already in place. And uh, we're going to be standing one up starting next year. And, um, you know, so the early uh, foundation of that has been started now under NAV I-4. But, uh, but we're going to be starting that up and figuring out how, what the right approach and how to best organize that, um, that command and um, in how it's going to work with the other warfare development commands. Because... All of those others are already integrating information warfare into what they do, and to some degree, that's because there was a void because we didn't have one. So, how do we um, stand that up and pull the right pieces in for that information warfare development command to be um, most effective at training and preparing our fleet for future war fights? Mm -hmm. um, with that, do you? Um, and this is a question that I had a discussion on um, previously. Um, do you see us creating programs where we um, try and uh, get that skill set and expertise as people are going through college, maybe a, um, uh, a targeted education uh, to an, uh, an enhanced training track um, to, help, uh, to help us really develop the type of skill set that we want to see within our Navy as opposed to just um, hoping that we get the right people uh, coming into the Navy and then training them? Mm -hmm. Well, some of that we're doing now with the, at the Naval, the Naval Academy. Uh, you know, we have some really exciting uh, improvements in the 
um, cyber curriculum at the Naval Academy, for example. And so people coming out of that curriculum have a, a significant uh, leg up on other people who have just a more generic um, curriculum. So we certainly have that at the Naval Academy. We have, there are some, uh, some ROTC uh, universities that have some really good curriculums, but not, but nothing that that we're targeting or you know or uh, mandating in any way. We certainly do that though at the at the advanced degree level. So our Naval Postgraduate School and the curriculums that are available for uh, information warfare at the Naval Postgraduate School really help to um, target the kind of advanced edu education that we need for our uh, information warfare leaders for the future. I think the idea of doing something like that, though, is a really good one, and and probably worth uh, looking into more in um, more of our ROTC programs if we if we had the ability to do that. All right, thank you, ma'am. Um, we have another question from the audience, and I'll see if I can get through this. Um, can you share anything about discussions or the drama surrounding the MUOS five uh, rocky ride to its operational orbit? Uh, let's see. I don't know what uh, what you know what the, what to share. So, of course, the MULES five launched and uh, and had some problems during the launch, and um, and it's amazing what a whole bunch of rocket science scientists can figure out when they get together and put their brains together because um, because they did lots of calculations and um, figured out that they could slowly move that satellite into uh, the orbit that it needed to be. And um, now it is actually, you know, in the right, uh, right orbit. And, um, and so uh, what could have been sort of an Apollo 13 kind of moment, what could have been a disaster looks like, um, like it, it may end up having, having real operational capability on orbit, um, despite the, the problems that it had um, from launch. All right, thank you, ma'am. And um, we are nearing the end of our time, but if you have a couple more minutes, um, there's just a, another question or two. Do you sure. Know? Okay. All right. Um, another question that was asked, what are your current thoughts on developing the DAWIA Certified Acquisition Professionals Program or Program Managers within the IWC? Uh, the, the, uh, the acquisition track uh, you know, specialty in the information warfare community has been something that uh, that we've kind of debated and tried a number of times to figure out what the right mix is, and we continue to do that because uh, because we as leaders in the IWC absolutely see the need for uh, acquisition professionals and those skills across the information warfare community, um, and we have a number of those billets and um, a lot of people who have that kind of expertise, and uh, there is, you know, nobody that, that is better in terms of uh, acquiring our systems than somebody who actually has been out in the fleet operating those systems and knows what it takes to maintain those systems so they know what uh, what they need uh, in terms of what those um, programs are expected to deliver so we continue to work to um, to to uh, grow expand the billet base for the acquisition community and and work on how we can uh, provide career paths in a specialty track for acquisition uh, across the IWC. All right, thank you, ma'am. And it's always a bonus, uh, you know, certainly for, for the qualifications at a selection board when, when a selection board sees that in addition to all of the, the core um, job assignments that somebody in the information warfare community has that they've also gotten their DAWIA uh, uh, qualifications, that's a big bonus. All right, well, that's good to know. Hopefully that answered that question. I think it did. Um, then we have one final comment. Um, I, we have a fan of yours. Um, she hopes to work with you someday. She loves canes. So that's a shout out to Chief Cummings. Um, and just talks about what an inspirational leader you are, which I think we can all see through this interview. Uh, we've, we've really appreciated it. Um, do you have any uh, final thoughts to share with us? Uh, just that I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to the community. This is a, a really terrific uh, venue um, through the IW Self Sync, and 
and I like the ability to do this. I'd love to do it again sometime and certainly would encourage other um, leaders in the IWC to do it as well. But it would be fun to also get some, uh, some junior people on here and talk about different perspectives and different uh, challenges that they're going through and, uh, and give everybody an opportunity to learn from that as well. So um, I, I will just end by saying that uh, for all of you who are in the information warfare community, your vision and your skill set is um, incredibly well recognized and valued by the senior leaders in the Navy. Uh, I will personally attest to that from all of the four stars in the Navy that they recognize what you do is absolutely critical to Navy warfighting and the joint warfight. And uh, so if you ever think that that what you do goes unnoticed, it, it might in the details, but it certainly doesn't in the aggregate. What you do is really important. And I thank you for the work that you do every day. All right, thank you so much. And really thank you for joining us, ma'am. Um, this has been a great session and um, we appreciate uh, you taking the time to do this. And uh, we do look forward to hopefully having another session with you again. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am.